Oh, my goodness. Okay. I was chatting away for the longest time, and it makes sense now that nobody can hear me. So, <laughs> Welcome, everyone. This is Janita Damien. I'm going to repeat myself here. I have the distinct privilege, privilege of working with Discovery Education's corporate partnerships, and one of my absolute favorites is Explore the Blue, which is brought to you by the Take Me Fishing campaign, uh, which is a website, takemefishing.org. How many of you kids out there have ever been fishing before? Raise your hand and let your teachers know. I hope that many of you have been able to go out and explore. And if you are great fishermen and women and you want more information, you definitely can check out explorettheblue.com or takemefishing.org. Um, so I really enjoyed uh, seeing everybody do this opening activity. Um, the hook while you wait, uh, if you could come up with the title of that fish and where you think it's from. And also in the chat window, let us know what state you're from, what grade level you have, and how many students. And make sure that when you're chatting, you mark all participants. Um, my colleague Kate is on the line, and she's going to be moderating that chat window throughout the day, so our hour. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat window, and we'll make sure that Ben, if we have time at the very end, has time to answer all your questions. So thanks, everyone, for joining. I have one more riddle to get our brains going and the fish going fish forward. Who thinks they can solve this uh, riddle for us? This actually comes from explorettheblue.com. It's Fish Hangman. I love Hangman. I loved it as a kid, and I still love it as an adult. So. This is a, a hangman, but we can't actually do it right now because it's just a screen grab. But some you want to swap and some you want to cast. Let's see who can guess the answer. This might be more like fast to see, uh, fingers for the teachers. Some you want to swap and some you want to cast. Anybody want to guess what it is, what the answer is? A bug is close. There you go, Holly. Very good. It's a fly. Excellent. So we're going to show you where some of those great interactive um, sites are uh, a little bit later on. But right now what I'm going to do, you're going to see your screens go blank for just a second. I'm going to share my desktop with you. And on my desktop, you should be able to see a PowerPoint presentation with the same slide that we just seen. If you're looking for your chat window, it's going to be in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And you can feel free, again, to chat in there throughout the, uh, the session, and Kate will be monitoring that so we can get questions at the very end. And actually, let me just do this real fast, Kate, so I can un – no, I did unmute you. Perfect. Okay. Here we go. So if your teachers asked you to write a story today, you'd probably pull out your notebook or a piece of paper and begin writing. But what would you do if you didn't if paper hadn't even been invented yet? Or what would you use if paper had become extinct? Think about that for just a second. How would you share your story? Well, people have been telling stories for years and years now. It started around campfires and on the walls of caves using drawings, and that was the way that they shared their stories. I'm sure many of you may have been camping before and have told stories around the campfire, and that's the beginning of storytelling. dates way, way back into early times. And then we had the creation of writing utensils, and everybody uh, in the – on the chat window now and out there across the nation has used probably pens and pencils and maybe even you, some of you have even tried to use a feather before that's dipped in ink. So writing has changed a lot over the years. And of course today, in today's time, many of us are typing our stories onto computers. But we did have a transition not too long ago where we actually started capturing the video, the audio, the image, the sound, everything, and creating something called digital stories. So this is actually a picture of one of the first um, video cameras. And now many of you actually probably have video cameras uh, at your house, maybe in your parents' pockets, maybe in some of yours that actually phones, smartphones that can actually capture video and images to help you write your own story. But no matter what time, what time period, or where you're at, stories always contain certain elements. And I'm sure many of you have talked about characters. For just a moment, turn to your neighbor and share, what's your favorite character of all time in any book or any movie? 
what's your character? Feel free to put them in that chat window for us so we can see. Eeyore. I love Eeyore. Curious George. That's a fav uh, favorite one in my house, too. Excellent. Excellent. So every story has great characters, has a great setting. I love beautiful places. Um, and they always have a plot or a sequence of events. They always have some things interesting that are going on. And they always have a theme, some type of lesson that we probably should learn throughout. So we're going to start ours today. Um, with our character, and I want to make sure that you guys can see that, so let me move that out of the way. Sorry about that. Perfect. So our character today is Ben Parker, and I had the privilege of meeting him not too long ago over the phone, and he is quite an interesting character with quite an inspiring story. So I'd like to turn it over to Ben, and Ben, can you share with us a little bit about who you are? Hey guys, I, first of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me to do this today. It's uh, uh, always a pleasure to help out when I can. And uh, to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I was born and raised in Tennessee, and currently I'm a professional bass fisherman, and I've been doing this for a couple of years now. And I decided to quit my former career and devote all my time to fishing and teaching lessons about fishing, and and that's into many different aspects of, of my career now. And uh, I currently live on Kentucky Lake, which is actually in Tennessee. It's just a couple of hours west of Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm sure everyone's heard of Nashville before. It's a great place to live. Can you tell us a little bit about this picture, Ben? The picture we're looking at now is, is a tournament that a good friend of mine, Chuck Murray, from North Carolina, uh, and I fished in a couple, uh, it's been two or three years ago. This was the Triton Owners Tournament. So if you were running a Triton boat at the time, you can sign up and, and fish this tournament. And it's absolutely a huge tournament that they have every year here at Kentucky Lake. And, and when I started my professional fishing career, this was my first big win along with Chuck. It was a team event. So we were partners. And... Uh, we caught a ton of fish. It was just absolutely a great experience, and that just really set a fire in me to uh, uh, pursue my career and my dream in professional bass fishing. Mm -hmm. How much did that fish weigh, Ben, that you have in your hands? You know, it was this was a two-day event, and we could weigh in five fish each day, and all ten of the fish that we weighed in in the total tournament looked just like these. They were all five-pound fish. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And did you take first place in this one? We did take first place in this one, and it was a really uh, – it's its really known as one of the toughest tournaments on Kentucky Lake because so many people entered. It was – there were about 600 people fishing in this event. Excellent. Thanks. And what's behind you in this picture, Ben? This is one of my like favorite. Fire. <laughs> it, it, this is a really cool picture, and uh, a photographer named James Overstreet took this photo at a recent uh, Bassmaster Elite Series event in, that we had this year uh, over on, uh, this was in Georgia. Um, I'm trying to think of the lake. We've fished at so many different lakes. This one was taken at West Point Lake in Georgia, and uh, that's actually a red clay bank in behind the boat there, and what you can't see is all the pine trees up above that, but this is actually during one of my tournaments this year as I was, uh, I just caught this fish and was landing it, and Mr. Overstreet took a lot of cool photos that day. Excellent. Thank you. Well, every story has a beginning, and we've all heard the once upon a time story. So, Ben, can you tell us a little bit about your beginnings, where you grew up? I grew up in Tennessee, up in the northwest corner uh, just along the Mississippi River, and where I grew up was way out in the country, and the lake there, which you'll see on this map in the very northwest corner, just a little bit left of the arrow there, a uh, place called Real Foot Lake. And this lake is a very special place, and my family, have, we've all lived here around the lake for several generations. And you can see this is a picture of my grandfather, uh, or two pictures of my grandfather, and yes, that's me, the little one there, uh, back when I was, oh man, I don't know how old I was, I was pretty young. 
but my grandfather spent a lot of time with me on the lake as well as my my father and and uh, I have a younger brother and you know that's where we grew up and we learned how to enjoy the outdoors and spend time on the water and have fun and and go fishing and you know spend time with our family it was a, a great you know upbringing excellent so tell us a little bit more about real foot state park and the lake where you spent a lot of your time oh real foot lake has an incredible history uh, this lake was actually formed by a series of earthquakes that happened in 1811 and 1812. Uh, it happened during the winter time, and there are actually several uh, old diary entries, journal entries from the time period of people that lived around the lake. And there was several. There was some people claim up to 30 earthquakes that happened during the winter time. And what happened to this lake is that it was formed by an earthquake, which is it doesn't happen very often. What happened was the earthquakes were so tremendous that all this land, and really it was about, then it was about 30,000 acres of land that was kind of bottom land that, that lies right along the east side of the Mississippi River sank. And the Mississippi River actually backfilled this area. And then the subsequent earthquake sealed it and formed the lake, which Real Foot Lake right now, uh, water, that this area you see on the map here is about 16,000 acres, and that's that's the lake today. But what another thing that makes this very interesting, and you can see a picture here of <clears throat> this big peninsula. This is a, kind of zoomed in on one area of the lake, and what is formed are these basins these large areas of open water and what you don't see is that there are tons of old cypress trees that are long gone underneath the water so stumps and logs and things are everywhere in the, out in these basins it makes it really great for fishing these trees you see here are actually bald cypress trees and they live out in the lake it's one of the few trees um, in the country that can actually live and sustain and live for many, many, many years being, you know, with the bottom of the tree submerged underwater. This place never goes dry. This They always have water on these trees. And what a lot of people don't know is that the bald cypress can live hundreds, even over a thousand years old. The oldest cypress tree on record right now is one out in North Carolina and they guesstimate it to be over 1,600 years old. So the trees you see in this picture here were hundreds of years old, even before 1811, 1812, which is a really neat thing. I find it fascinating. Yeah, they certainly are beautiful. I'd love to, to take a little boat ride through there. It looks gorgeous, especially this time of the year. Uh, that's Absolutely. fall, and the leaves are changing colors. Mm-hmm. Well, in this oh, ecosystem, there's a there's a lot of you know lily pads and cut grass and and cypress trees and moss and it brings so many birds and so many fish to live here. It's just a really great place to a great place to be. And we have a huge population of bald eagles that that uh, winter on Real Food Lake. Beautiful. So I'm just wondering for the students that are out there, if you could just take a moment and turn to your neighbor or partner and tell us. Who takes you out to explore? We heard that Ben's grandpa was one of the first people out to take him out fishing that he spent a lot of his time with. So who takes you out to explore the outdoors? And have you ever been to a lake, river, or ocean? And what did you do there? Did you just play? Did you fish? Um, did you build sand castles? So we're just going to give you a few minutes to turn to your neighbor and share. And then if some of your teachers can share in that chat window and let us see what's there, that would be great. In just a few minutes. Who takes you out to explore? Have you ever been to a lake, river, or ocean? And what did you do there? Excellent work. Um, in addition to great characters, every story has to have um, 
a great sequence of events, a great plot. We call it a plot, but it's just a sequence or a series of events that happen at the beginning, the middle, and the end of a story. So, Ben, I hear that you haven't always been a fisherman. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the different career choices that you made over the years? Well, my mother was an educator, and she taught school. I actually had her in high school, and uh, one of the big things in our family was it's very important to get an education. And, yes, I did grow up hunting and fishing my whole life, and I went to college at the University of Memphis in Memphis, Tennessee, and I gained a degree in business finance and decided to become an investment broker. And I did that for about eight and a half years, and it took me on a, a really cool adventure all over the country. Um, I ended up working with a company called, well, I won't, I won't mention the name, but I worked for a company out of San Francisco. And this is a picture of me and my father in San Francisco. And it was a major, major change from where I grew up in Tennessee. Um, but, I, you know, I learned a lot of cool things about business and about people and about marketing. And I actually used those same tools I learned in the business world to convert that over into the fishing world, which is what I'm doing now. And there are a lot of similarities. Excellent. So I think it's very interesting. Oh, and there you are as a fisherman now. So you went from this big city. So we saw pictures of Real Foot Lake where it was um, a lot of vegetation and a lot of wildlife to this big city where the wildlife's a little bit different, I have a feeling, <laughs> a lot of um, human wildlife. And then we, you um, decided to go back and chase your dream as a fisherman. So I really think that's fascinating. And I know kids out there, a lot of you have dreams of becoming um, certain uh, career choices in your life. So I was wondering if you could take just a few minutes, like just a minute to turn to your neighbor now and talk about two different jobs that you would love to have when you grow up. So what are two different jobs you would love to have when you grow up? And feel free, teachers, to share some of those, uh, what they'd like to be when they grow up in the chat window for all of us to see. Just a few minutes. Turn to your neighbor and tell what are two different jobs that you would like to have when you grow up? Excellent. Thank you, kids. So I know, Ben, you just mentioned that um, you learned some valuable things from being a stockbroker that help you uh, in your career as a fisherman. Can you talk specifically about some of those things? Yeah, you know, uh, one of the best things is actually marketing. And it's that's basically where you're trying to sell yourself and you're trying to meet as pe many people as you can. And, you know, in the business world, um, I would try to make as many contacts as I could and try to help as many people as I could. And when I converted over to fishing, uh, those, those that business model that I learned uh, in my early career, uh, I've just converted it over. So I'm doing things now like television shows. Uh, I've been on the news several times. I'm filming a television show about fishing next week uh, on Bass Fishing University. And I've also made my first DVD this year. Uh, which is bass under glass, and what I'm doing is I'm actually teaching people how to use their electronics on their boats uh, so that they can see fish on their electronics and they, and, and they know where to go fishing and they know how to find them. So um, all of these things are really intertwined in a business sense from marketing and sales and doing what you have to do to make a living. Can you tell us a little bit about this picture? Yeah, you know, from time to time, I love to volunteer. Um, I actually volunteered for my – I'm a member of my local bass club. It's called the Real Foot Lake Bass Club. And we actually have a kids club. So we have about 20 children um, that are, you know, junior high, high school age. And I volunteered a while back as a boat captain in one of our kids club tournaments. And, and uh, these two guys right here are just great fishermen. This, this is a um, – we call these five fish, and 
we won first place, and we caught the biggest fish of the tournament, or I should say the kids did. And uh, it's just a fun way to get out and enjoy the outdoors, especially on Saturdays when uh, when, when all of our kids, they're raring to go fishing, and, and it's just great to be able to uh, uh, take a little bit of time and take kids out and uh, enjoy the outdoors. Excellent. Well, so speaking of outdoors, Ben, another very, very important part of stories is a setting, and a setting is where a story takes place. And it seems like you've had the opportunity to travel all around this nation and even in other countries to go fishing. So can you tell us a little bit about some of your favorite settings and why? Oh, I tell you what, I've been all over the country. I haven't fished every lake in the country, but I've fished a bunch of them. And I fished here out in the Gulf of Mexico. I did that earlier uh, this year, it just as a fun fishing trip with my friends. And, and uh, it's just, you know, fishing's just an amazing occupation uh, because we get to go and meet so many different people and go see so many different lakes and bodies of water. Um, I love the Great Lakes. Uh, that fishing up there is just so fun. Um, I live, you know, and grew up on Real Foot Lake, and I fished the Tennessee River, uh, more specifically Kentucky Lake a lot. And, and this is a photo of this past summer. That is a huge amberjack that we caught out in the Gulf of Mexico. We uh, actually went out of Orange Beach, Alabama, and went straight out in the Gulf uh, and maybe out a little bit off the coast of Louisiana, and the fishing there was just great. I mean, we and I went, it was 12 of us that went, and uh, we actually spent two nights out on the water on this huge boat. This boat was like almost 70 feet long, and uh, they had bunk beds and, you know, plenty of play, room to, to stay and enjoy uh, a whole three-day period out on the water. How and long, how big was this fish, Ben? <laughs> Excuse me? How big was this fish? How long and how Oh, big? this, how long? He had to be at least four feet long and probably weighed somewhere around 70 pounds. Oh, my goodness. I think that's probably taller and weighs more than some of the kids on the line right now. So it's well, awesome. I, I, it doesn't show me straining too much, but I promise you, I have my hands full. It's all I could do to get that shut that eye to take a photo. Uh -huh. I love this picture, too, um, Ben, that you share with us. It's the Gulf of Mexico, and so we can actually see Florida far off to the right. We might even have some students that are from Florida there. But can you tell us a little bit about the colors in this picture and also where you find the best places to fish are in the Gulf? Yeah, this is a really cool map because the darker blue shows that shows the water area that is way over a thousand feet deep. I mean, it is super deep out there. And the lighter color blue that just goes around the Gulf Coast there, um, you know, that may be a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred feet deep. Now, if you can find Florida and you move over to your left a little bit and you find a little area that's part of Alabama that touches the Gulf, right where the pointer is there. From that, that's where we put out at. Uh, that's where we went out from uh, in the boat. And we went straight out about where the pointer is there, right where it starts to fall off in that deep water. And we fished along through there over a 1,000 feet deep around these big, huge oil rigs. And those things are amazing because the fish just congregate around the oil rigs. And they're really cool to see. We fished about 150 miles off the coast of Alabama. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, tell us a little bit about this picture. This picture is just a group of some of my very best friends that, uh, you know, we don't all get a chance to get together too often. And we had to schedule this trip several uh, months ahead of time. But me and some of my great friends that live all over the country, I've got a couple of guys here that live in Florida, a couple of guys live in Texas, some some of them live in Kentucky, and the rest live in Tennessee. And uh, we all met down at Orange Beach Marina. And what you, the fish you see hanging up on the wall behind us are, are mostly yellowfin tuna, which are some of the best eating fish you can you can have. I, I just absolutely love them. We caught barracudas, we caught sharks, we caught amberjacks, and uh, I promise you, after after catching all these fish, I it wouldn't be surprised if all of them have already been eaten by now <laughs> because it's so good. You've actually caught sharks before. Absolutely. We caught uh, four or five sharks on this trip. 
But we let those go. We you didn't want to keep go? those. What's the biggest fish that you've ever caught? Oh, my goodness. Um, probably tuna on trips like this. Uh, sometimes we catch them upwards of 100 pounds. Wow, that must be really hard to reel in. Oh, you're you're absolutely tired when you get through, I promise. <laughs> Excellent. Tell us a little bit about Lake Erie. Lake Erie, um, out of all the places I fished, I, I saw on the chat someone lived up around Lake Superior or maybe grew up around Lake Superior. I haven't been up there, but I have fished Lake Erie and a small lake called Lake St. Clair, which is just on the other side of Detroit, Michigan. And I've actually spent quite a bit of time up there fishing. And Lake Erie is a really cool lake because it is just so huge. I mean, this is this is one of the great lakes. And Lake Erie, you know, it borders Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and to the north you have Canada. So this this Lake Erie, it just it stretches just for several several hundred miles. And the smallmouth bass in Lake Erie are just phenomenal, and they're really fun to catch. Is that what this one is? Yeah, that's that's actually a photo of a smallmouth bass that I caught in Lake St. Clair, which is just on the other side of the city of Detroit from Lake Erie. Um, Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie are connected by the Detroit River, which is a, a fairly short river that just connects these two big lakes. And uh, the water there is so beautiful. It's, it's the the neatest color aqua blue you've ever seen. You can see in this photo. And this was a, a photo of a large of, of a smallmouth bass that I caught that day. And uh just wanted to take a quick picture of it before I let it go. I love this is probably my favorite photo of all the ones. Um tell us a little bit about here. You look pretty victorious. Oh my goodness. This is what I did not know I was about to get into. Um my brother went with me on a fishing trip to Lake Erie, and we were practicing for a tournament. And we get about 20 miles out from Detroit, out in the middle of the lake. Now, you can't see any land around you. And we come across this storm. And it was a really cool photo opportunity because it looked just so beautiful with the sun coming up over the storm clouds. And, and we stopped. And you can see the water here is, is relatively calm for Lake Erie. Uh, but what we didn't know was it was not calm under that storm, and we were <laughs> soon to be right in the middle of it, and it was probably one of the scariest times I've ever had on the water. Excellent. I'm going to pause you for a moment right before you tell us a little bit more, and I'm going to kick it back to the kids for a moment. If you were writing a fish tale, where would your story take place? In an ocean, lake, or river, and why? We're going to have you turn to your neighbor for just a moment and share with your neighbor or with your class. Raise your hand. If you were writing your own fish tale, where would your story take place? In an ocean, lake, river, and why? And share with us in the chat window. We'll give you just a minute to do that. Well, thanks for sharing with us. Um, ben, another really important part of any story and part of that plot sequence is a conflict, some type of problem that you've overcome. And you've just given us a little foreshadowing, a little bit of insight, because so far all your pictures seem like they're sunny days and great days to be on the lake or the river or out in the ocean. So can you talk to us a little bit more about um, some scary times that you've had? I'll tell you, had to overcome? I can. Uh, one day on Lake Erie, uh, I went out and waves. This is not my boat, but there were waves just like this. And on top of that, it was storming and raining and lightning, and it was just a terrible time. And the waves were so big that you couldn't see it, see it over the top of them, just like in these photos. 
Now, when all this is going on, I'm not going to take a time out and to grab my camera and take a picture because I'm scared to death. I'm thinking there's no way this Tennessee boy is going to get off this lake alive. It was just so, so terrible. The waves were over, you know, eight, nine, ten feet tall, and I'm in this little 21-foot bass boat. Um, and while we were out in the storm, we actually took on so much water that it filled the boat completely full of water, and I thought, what am I going to do now? Wow. I wonder what you did do. So, kids, sometimes you have to have more than one solution because if you try something that doesn't work, you have to have a backup plan. So for just a moment, I want you guys to turn and talk to each other and, and answer. What do you think happened next? The water is filling the boat. The waves are, are striking high. What do you think happened next? And what are some pop possible solutions? What do you think Ben could have done to be prepared or to help get himself out of that situation? We know you survived, Ben, so we're excited about that. But I wonder what happened next and what were some I'm of the possible solutions. <laughs> I'm excited so, about that. <laughs> excellent. So, kids, just turn to your neighbor or with your class, talk about what do you think happened next in that boat? Share with us in the chat window some things that you think Ben could have done or what you think happened next or some possible solutions. Excellent. Okay, Ben, we're going to turn it back to you. What happened next? I tell you, um, fortunately, before I went out on the water, I did see uh, the weather forecast, and I cut it too close. That was my mistake. I thought I could beat the storm, but I didn't. And fortunately, before I went on the water and before I took my trip to Lake Erie, I'd heard all these rumors about how rough the lake gets, so what I did was I had actually installed two extra water pumps, bills pumps, inside the boat just in case that did happen. And uh, I'm glad they worked well because the two small pumps that I had in the boat originally, they would have eventually pumped all the water out, but it would have been just miserable. Uh, and because I had put the two extra pumps in the boat, uh, I evacuated that water out pretty quickly and uh, was able to slowly but surely make it off the lake. But let me tell you, it was a very close call. Oh, my goodness. That sounds terrifying. Uh, but we're glad you made it out alive. So the last uh, and very important part of any story is to have a theme. And I think what um, Ben has been able to do today with us is talk to us more about how we can explore the blue, different types of waterways, what we can do uh, when we're above it, and what's going on below the water. And also, I think Ben just has a great story, and I think we should uh, say that again, that, you know, you have to chase your dreams. And so Ben's dream from the time he was a child was to fish and to be outdoors. And although he took a little time to explore other options, he came back to his dream to follow it. And as a result, is now on television and has his own um, websites and programs and different things like that. So it's such an inspiring story, Ben, and we thank you so much for sharing it. So let's just take a look one more time. And in the chat window, uh, share with us what was the most fascinating thing that you learned today? What was your favorite part about Ben's incredible fishing tale? Tales, actually, since he's... he's <laughs> what was most interesting or most fascinating to you? Share in that chat window. Excellent. And Janine, if you don't mind, I'm going to post my website address on there if they want to check out more about yes. what I that do. Would be perfect. 
Now, how many of you would like to go fishing with Ben? Raise your hand if you think it would be so much fun to go fishing with Ben right now. I have a feeling there are a lot of virtual hands being raised across the nation. So I thought it would be fun if we took a little fishing expedition all together so we can all, no matter where you're at, go fishing right now with Ben. So we're going to play a little game. I'm sure you kids love to play games. Um, so I thought it would be fun to do one online with people from all across the nation. And the game that we're going to play is called Thrill of the Catch. And it can be found on the Explore the Blue website. It's explorettheblue.com. And I'm going to have my friend Kate type that in the chat window real fast, but I need you to pay very close attention. So I need all the kids to sit up nice and straight and put your hands in your lap. So I'm going to give you some very specific instructions so that we can see who could win the game, okay? So the game is called Thrill of the Catch. And when you go to uh, explorettheblue.com, teachers, in just a moment, when you click on Thrill of the Catch, you're going to click Go Fishing. So we're going to go fishing together. Now, the first thing that you're going to be able to do when you launch the game, boys and girls, is pick where you want to fish. Pick what waterway do you want to fish? So since we have the expert on the line, Ben, can you talk <laughs> to us a little bit about why would we want to choose inlet, shoreline shallows, weed beds or open water. Can you give us some advantages to each? Oh, I tell you, you know, sometimes it depends on the time of year, and sometimes it depends on oxygen levels in the water. Uh, to talk a little bit about each one, if if you're fishing in an inlet, you see there where there's a small river coming into the body of water. Um, you know, if I, if, if I was going to this lake for the first time, I would take a look at that area because it looks like there might be some really fresh moving water coming into the inlet, and a lot of times fish love that. They love that moving water. It's full of oxygen. It's full of bait. It, uh, it's just a really cool place uh, to try to catch fish. If you go over to Shoreline Shallows, uh, that to me looks like a place I'd want to spend some time maybe in, in the spring when the fish are spawning or in the fall uh, when the water temperature is starting to cool down. Uh, you'll, you'll find a lot of bait fish around there, which is going to attract larger fish. Uh, in open water, actually I'm going to skip over weak beds. In open water, uh, to me, that's more of a place we want to go in the hot summertime when there's a lot of deep uh, really good clear water and the fish can can get a break from the hot sun and, and, and actually go down deeper in the water column and, and hide. So if it was hot summertime, that's where I'd want to go. Um, weed beds, so that could be good probably any time of the year. Uh, because of all the weeds growing underwater, those weeds actually produce oxygen. And I know that any time I go to a lake that has a lot of weeds or, or underwater grass, whether it's coontail moss or hydrilla, uh, those are places where a lot of little bait fish are going to live because there's a lot of little hiding places all in that grass. And that water is automatically going to be really high in oxygen, which the fish love, and it's going to attract some really big fish. So that's uh, kind of a toss-up. I'm personally kind of leaning toward the weed beds. Uh, but I bet you could catch fish in any, any location. Excellent. So once you've picked your – so when you get on that website, Teachers and Tunes, you're going to have to either – you have to select either the inlet, the shoreline, shallows, the weed beds, or the open water. And once you do that, a screen like this is going to appear, and the fish are going to come up to your line. And you can see right there that I just hooked a fish. In order to pull this fish up to the boat to see how much he weighs, you have to cl click where it says click here – multiple times over and, over and 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 over again until it gets all the way up to the boat. If you are able to successfully capture that fish, what's going to happen is it's going to tell you the fish name. This is, I caught Mrs. Cleopatra Bubbles. The weight, so Mrs. Cleopatra Bubbles weighed 1.6 pounds, uh, was a foot and two inches long, was only one day old, and was created by Captain John. So you're going to um, – oh, and it's a large mouth bass. So, Ben, did I do okay? Is that a pretty good size for a large mouth bass, or should I have waited a little – should I throw this one back? I would throw it back. I would throw it back. We want it to get about four or five pounds before we keep it. Okay, perfect. And I want the kids to know, too, teachers, that sometimes uh, catch after you catch multiple fish, 
notice the difference between like the age and the weight because sometimes uh, the longer, the older it is, the more it weighs, but sometimes older fish don't weigh very much. So uh, pay attention to that. And then the only other thing that you can do is in the lower right-hand corner when you're logged in, you're going to see a picture of a recycling bin. And if you're playing at home and you see trash floating around, you can actually recycle it. But the main thing I want you to do is click that tackle box. And in that tackle box, you're going to have the option to change bait. So you might decide that a different type of bait is more appropriate or might catch a bigger fish. So for just a moment, since we do have the expert available to us, Ben, can you tell us a little bit about what types of bait we might want to, to use to catch the biggest fish? Oh, the biggest fish. If you went purely on size, I'm not sure if they have catfish on that on the game, but if they did, night crawlers would probably be one of the one of the best things you could use. Um night crawlers catch so many different fish from bluegill to catfish. Um if you go over to the right, where it shows a small jig there, uh, that's used to imitate a small bait fish or a small minnow. And a lot of times on live bait uh, or using a jig like this, you're going to catch uh, more like crappies, say, for example. The same thing goes for using minnows. If you use a live minnow, that will catch just about anything. If you go down to the cut bait, the cut bait is primarily used for catfish. Other fish might eat that, but the big old catfish, they're going to eat the cut bait. Um, a spinner, again, this is going to mimic a live minnow, but it's going to be fished totally different where you cast it out and just reel it in. Uh, spinner, they'll catch anything from bass to crappie. And we've got a grub over here on the side, too. That's one of my favorite things to try to catch smallmouth bass. Um, again, that mimics a, a live fish, and if fished properly, you're liable to catch just about anything. Excellent. So are you guys ready to go fishing? So I'm going to have my friend Kate paste in the chat window the Explore the Blue uh, website, explorethebluecom When you get to that home page, click Thrill the Catch, then select Go Fishing, select your waterway, select your bait, and go fishing. And we're just going to give you about one or two minutes to do that, so you're going to have to move a little bit fast. But in the chat window, make sure that you share with us the name, the weight, the length, and the age of your fish. So let's can see which class across the nation can catch the biggest one, okay? So in the chat window, let us know your biggest catch. Include the name, the weight, the length, and the age. And uh, you're going to go to explorethebluecom There's that website. And uh, once you get there in the center section, click through all the catch. So we'll give you just a few minutes to get going on that. I'll pull it up too. And I'll tell you one other thing, uh, Janita, if all of you, if you're excited about fishing, uh, feel free to look me up on Facebook. Um, I have a ton of friends that, that fish all over the country, and we all love to post pictures of, of fish that we catch and stories. And uh, so if any of you guys uh, like to be friends on Facebook, look me up, Ben Parker, and I'm from Tennessee, and I think that's all you would need to know. Perfect. If you could put that in the chat window too, Ben, that would be great. <laughs> the sound effects alone here are going to make me want to go out on the water. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about going when I get off the phone. What are you talking about? <laughs> Uh, 
and check that chat window and see if anybody's caught anything yet. Oh, yes. Four pounder. That's what I'm nice. talking about. Yeah. I actually took a good friend of mine and his eight-year-old son, Stone, uh, fishing Sunday afternoon, and I posted a really cool picture of a stone and a big largemouth bass he caught Sunday afternoon on Kentucky Lake. It was a really cool afternoon. Nice. I'll give you about one more minute. So if you've caught another fish or if you've caught a fish, please put in the chat window and let us know. I'm seeing more pop up. Shorty small head Michael, three point eight pounds. Perfect. I'm going to bounce back to the PowerPoint real fast because I want to share a few more things with you here. So uh, if you still want to explore more and play more when you get at home, uh, kids and students, all you need to do is go to – oops, sorry about that. I'm going to have to sh turn off my sound effects here. Sorry about that. Perfect. If you go to explorethebluecom uh, teachers, make sure you click on the link educate, educate because in that link you're going to find all kinds of free, uh, great lesson plans for you. You can go out and play fish tag with your students, um, and there's also lessons on uh, language arts and how to write your story. And a great um, twist to all of this, uh, uh, teachers, is to do digital storytelling. So. If you do have a PC computer and you want to put together your kids' fishing tale, uh, you can use Photo Story 3 for Windows. Photo Story 3 for Windows, teachers, you definitely want to check that out. Um, and again, we also have, you see here, the resources for grades 3 to 5, too. There is about writing imaginary trip and also learning about different fishing methods. And I know we talked about a little bit about that today, so there's just some extensions for you. Kids, you definitely want to go to explorethebluecom and there's two spots on explorethebluecom that you want to click. And the first one's going to be Explore, and that's where you're going to find all of those great games like Thrill of the Catch uh, and Fish Hangman, so you can actually play it. Uh, create a fish. Uh, you saw the fish that I was able to create for you guys, but you can create your own. There's a fish matching and a fish finder pro as well. When you click on the family connection. There's some really great activities. You can actually build an aquarium terrarium out of two liter soda bottles and there's a great, uh, you can't see it in this screenshot right here, but a great <coughs> observational journal so the next time you go for a walk with your parents or information about how to uh, solve pollution uh, problems in the waterway. So make sure that you go to explorethebluecom there's also under the Family Connection a great habitat map, and we learned a little bit more about Tennessee today. So if you wanted to learn more, you could click on that state and find out all about the habitats, the plants and the animals and the fish and the waterways from those areas. So make sure you check out the habitat map. Uh, I just really want to thank you, Ben. What an inspiring story and uh, such an encouraging word to get, I think, all of us motivated to, go, motivated to go fishing. I know I'd like to go give it a shot again. It's probably been years since I've been out fishing, but I think uh, this year will be a year I'll go back uh, because of your inspiring story. So 
I want to also thank Explore the Blue and the Take Me Fishing uh, campaign that makes these uh, webinars available to us uh, so that we can talk to experts like you, Ben, and, and be inspired to go outdoors. So um, I know we're probably cutting, we're very close to time, but if anybody has any questions about fishing or any of the expedition that Ben has been on, uh, if you want to post that in the chat window, I'm going to escape, hold on, and go right back to the event center. Um, give me two seconds here. Perfect. So in that chat window now, if you have any questions for Ben, we can uh, share them. And he can answer some of them. Congratulations to, to Miss Hughes' class. They caught a 4.2 pound. That's pretty big. Excellent. Any questions you might have for Mr. Parker? And if not, we thank you for coming and we encourage you to join us for other webinars in the future. Oh, that's a great question. Um, what's the most money you won at a tournament? Oh, this year I won several, won at least $10,000 in I think three different tournaments. Um, I kind of need that every week. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but this this year 10000 bucks was the, uh, uh, and I won $10,000 three different times and then won lesser amounts of money in, in some other events. Excellent. Ten thousand, that's a lot of money. <laughs> now I am yeah. reading now. Okay, now my kids want to go be professional fishermen. Well let me give you a point of advice. If you don't get an education, then you're not gonna be able to do it because uh getting a good education gives you plans and gives you backup plans. Um I wanted to be a professional fisherman, but I didn't have the money and the resources just to do it. So I had to get a good education and go out and get into business and make some money and and uh and make the transition over. And the good thing is is if I ever decide to stop fishing then I have something to fall back on. So uh it's just a way of protecting yourself. I think that's very true. It's always good to have plan B. That's right. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. I'm going to stop the recording now, but you'll receive an email within a week with the archive um, and also a link for certificates. Thanks for joining us. And we'll stay on for just a few more minutes if you have any additional questions.